So today's theme is going to be um, uh, industrial control systems um, and uh, Ben's presentation is going to go deeper into uh, one of the examples of that but I kind of wanted to before he presents he wanted to, I wanted to provide kind of the broader perspective on what the issues there are and what are these things and what makes them vulnerable. And then after this, um, I'll switch gears a little bit and start going into specific mechanisms. So we have heard about like cryptography, software protection, stuff like that. So the next few lectures, we are going to look into you now specific uh, mechanisms and more depth. So uh, we saw implantables and vehicles. Um, uh, ILCs, uh, I, uh, uh, ICS or industrial control systems broadly refer to computers which are being used in manufacturing, factories, all sort of things which you generally would associate with industrial stuff. So this um, typically you would hear them in context of electrical grid, power plants, stuff like that. So. Um, at one kind of at some level you can uh, think of them as uh, uh, kind of uh, stuff which is basically reading computers which are basically reading sensors controlling actuators running control loops usually PID control loops uh, in these kind of settings. So focus traditionally for these systems uh, has been cost efficiency particularly cost efficiency because uh, a lot of times in terms of the sheer performance, they're actually reasonably modest performance in the sense that you're talking about tens of milliseconds type control loops, relatively simple sensor data, um, opening walls, closing walls, reading temperature, process control, those kind of things. And since a lot of this stuff uh, also is for safety critical applications, uh, so uh, uh, safety has always been uh, something that people who have designed these systems have worried about. But hopefully one thing if you take away from this course and that is uh, designing for safety in the sense of dealing with noise and failure and error is quite different than when you are dealing with an adversary because adversary is kind of engaged in a game with you. So. Uh, it's uh, generally a bad idea to think, uh, well it is a bad idea period, to think of an adversary as like noise. Um, it's not but rather, uh, rather adversary is out to get an advantage over you and uh, there are certain uh, things that uh, if you are thinking in terms of security, you will have to assume. Firstly, you have to assume that adversary knows things about you, you can't rely on um, obscurity. The second thing is adversary is not going to be static, they are going to adapt to your responses. So it will not be something where you can say okay, uh, uh, I can think of it as a particular characteristic which is how we deal with noise and all. So, um, so designing for security versus designing for safety are kind of different and uh, you see uh, the effect of that in the way these systems are designed. They are very rugged, they operate under very harsh conditions. They are designed to tolerate all sort of failures, they have the redundancy and those kind of mechanisms and yet uh, they are not secure. Um, and uh, I think I think particularly in kind of electrical engineering, we have always uh, dealt with noise, uncertainty uh, which is kind of non-adversarial in nature and there is a whole slew of techniques that uh, estimation theory and kind of other parts of let us say signals and systems have developed. But adversarial mindset tends not to be one of those. Um, so uh, that has begun to change in this area particularly because in the recent whatever let us say decade or so there have been plenty of attacks uh, which have been mounted on these systems uh, in large part because they are basically computers and uh, all the software related problems and hardware related problems that we develop our standard laptops and all also affect things out here. So what are the uh, uh, trends that are happening there? So it used to be that these were uh, kind of embedded computers kind of you 
would attach them to the equipment and they were sitting totally isolated. One thing which has begun to change is that they are increasingly connected to the internet and um, some of it is just because of monitoring their remote health and stuff like that. But uh, a lot of it is also uh, happening that uh, because uh, tasks associated with sensing and control are now often being moved into the cloud. So you, there's an emergence of companies which basically uh, are for a variety of reasons are basically providing sensing and control as a service sort of say. So your control algorithm uh, as networks are getting fast, as data centers uh, become cheap and uh, the cost of computing becomes cheap and latencies become tolerable. So a lot of companies have begun to move towards this model. So you see Amazon and uh, Microsoft and all these cloud service providers in uh, recent times have begun to provide IoT stacks, okay. So they basically are moving towards a model where uh, they're saying that look, uh, all the stuff that we have traditionally done out there, let's kind of move so at least pieces of it up to the cloud. So these these things have begun to uh, go sort of connected, making use of cloud services. Uh, the other thing is that um, as the understanding of the physical implications of these things have sort of uh, caught on to, if you may, the hacking community. So lots of people have begun to exploit it. So we have begun to hear increasingly about people messing with traffic lights or transportation infrastructure and things like that, uh, usually exploiting the cyber uh, sort of door because now in the convenience of some remote location, you can mount these attacks. Um, uh, since uh, uh, these systems are pretty widely deployed and also if you infiltrate one, there are probably a whole bunch of other uh, similar systems that you can infiltrate as easily. So it's very easy to mount physical attacks on large areas. So traditionally, physical attacks meant you go there, uh, this adversary has to be at the close to the physical site to be able to do something. Now you can mount physical attacks um, on hundreds or thousands of places uh, remotely. So that has. And uh, finally, uh, a lot of the stuff is sitting in infrastructure which uh, clearly has uh, national security kind of implications. Um, uh, so kind of uh, lots, uh, again in sort of uh, lots of articles and sort of uh, news items in all recent years have emphasized that how uh, a big concern uh, uh, is that how uh, hackers can take over some of these uh, kind of systems, particularly uh, sort of those controlling transportation and electrical grid and remotely kind of cause chaos. So these uh, systems, um, the variety of uh, acronyms that are common in this thing, but one couple of terms that you will hear quite a bit. So one is called SCADA, uh, Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. So this is a particular way of organizing uh, sensing, actuation, computing, all these kind of things in a systematic architecture. So often so you will hear like the SCADA system controlling the grid, for example. And they themselves have evolved and there are companies like Siemens and uh, Johnson Control and uh, these kind of companies who are in the business of supplying different pieces of it. So for example, on our campus, um, you would uh, like all, all our buildings and all um, have sensors, actuators, HVAC systems, they're kind of all networked together and then they uh, are controlled by, uh, they, they, uh, they're sort of PLCs at various places controlling let's say dampers and stuff like that and then they all uh, talk to some sort of a server that the facilities maintain. That's a very typical architecture you would see for buildings for example. Um, electrical grids and all are kind of the same. Uh, sense. So basically uh, there are uh, servers where um, all the data comes in, where policies are set, stuff is pushed out and uh, uh, redundancy and all are important. So you'll often see kind of uh, backup servers and stuff like that. And then you have on the other hand, other extreme, you have field devices uh, which are doing sensing control. Uh, some, some of the control is just so rapid speed that it has to be done locally close to the endpoint. So uh, the computers at the edges are often called, uh, called as programmable logic controllers. I'll talk about them 
two, three slides later. Um, but SCADA basically refers to this kind of overall architecture. And this architecture itself has evolved along with rest of information technology. So you see now richer structures um, coming there where um, kind of things are getting more remote. So it used to be that these servers might simply be in within the same factory and you have a local area network to now where things are happening over larger networks and as the networks are becoming um, uh, providing some better performance and also some of the control loops which were previously only possible um, at the edge could now often be across the network and uh, the various generations and associated standards and all have emerged and like I mentioned that now perhaps the latest thing is that some of these things are really becoming cloud services and all. And uh, so, so that's where we are and uh, there is uh, kind of the next generation in some senses is what very loosely they refer to oh they are adopting IoT technologies and all. So uh, there are a whole bunch of companies uh, which uh, um, uh, work uh, uh, like I said provide products and all in the space um, lots of specialized software and things like that. Uh, so there are companies who make uh, sort of the human machine interface, kind of the back-end software and then there are companies which provide kind of the edge devices and all. So the devices at the edge are uh, basically programmable logic computers, um, uh, con controllers, they are called PLCs and essentially they are like the embedded computers that you play with, of, in fact often times they are even you know, even simpler, but the main thing is they are ruggedized, they are modularized um, and uh, they have lots of sensors, actuators kind of interfaces. So you'll typically see there will be racks of these things and the PLCs come in some sort of modules and they kind of just plug into the rack. And uh, over time uh, they have certainly become more sophisticated, so it used to be that these things would be just low end microcontrollers. The latest one you will find like they are running Linux on some let us say mid, mid uh, mid-tier ARM processor, uh, they'll have Ethernet, uh, they may even have some FPGA to program them. So they kind of begin to look like your let us say Raspberry Pi class, uh, class, class stuff as well. So these rugged chassis deployed out in the field uh, controlling all, all sort of stuff. Uh, if you dig inside them, they are basically very simple, not very different than let us say the embed board, the beagle bones and all that we have played with. So some obviously CPU memory program data kind of thing, some power supply and basically they have input modules and output modules and typically what happens is uh, given PLC there would be multiple boards and so you will have a board corresponding to the main CPU and all and it will come with some sensors, sensor and actuator interfaces and then you can extend it by adding additional IO boards. Okay? And the IO boards would be either analog IO, so they have ADC or DAC. Or digital IO, so kind of a modular merit system in a very generic manner. What makes PLCs different than the kind of embedded systems we normally play with is how the software side of that is structured. So they are, uh, they are, what they do is really utterly simple, right? I mean, they observe sensors and they have to control actuators. So the whole programming paradigm there has been designed around that. So if you, and, and in fact, in a very restricted fashion, so. Those of you who are into a two way, we kind of talked about uh, we talked about different ways software gets organized. The software, the way they get organized in PLCs is extremely simple. Essentially, these things run on a periodic schedule, typically some sort of a frame which is uh, let's say 15, 20 milliseconds, something of that order. At the beginning of the frame, all the sensors are read. Then you have some logic through which you go through. And by the end of that 20 millisecond, you have computed the commands that you have to apply to the actuators. So read sensors at t equal to zero, compute, and ship the uh, control out to the actuators at t equal to 20 millisecond. And then you just keep repeating that process. Can you just like theorize by asking some of the parameters and going into a house and relationship? You could, it's the cost reasons. Uh, because remember, I mean, don't really need the horsepower of FPGAs. Um, uh, but again, in real cutting edge systems that has been going to see. So you, you can find um, I mean, there are um, uh, there are uh, PLCs now that do make FPGAs and they like to program them. Okay. Um, but uh, th those are those are rare. I mean these things do uh, look on the academic side we 
learn about a lot of very sophisticated signal processing and control and all. But the kind of stuff most of these things are doing is really very simple, right? I mean, observe some simple sensors, control some very simple actuators, turn on valves and stuff like that. So nothing, nothing that sophisticated kind of takes place um, uh, in most of these systems. So uh, this is what's happening out there. Uh, start the scan, some internal checks, scan the inputs, execute the program logic, and then dump it out to the actuator, and then kind of repeat the process. That's that's all they're doing uh, repeatedly. So very simple uh, computation model. And essentially what happens is these things are deployed out there, and then at some sort of um, uh, operator interface, which may be quite remote in case of electrical grids and all, it may be somewhere central, hundreds of miles away, and the operators uh, basically write programs except that they have some very specialized languages as we will see and uh, they push them out to these PLCs. That is basically what is happening and then uh, on the operator interface you also uh, uh, the, some uh, th these things every cycle they also kind of report back let us say uh, some anomalies and stuff like that. So they kind of again appear in the operation management uh, state. So that is what uh, like in these kind of things is happening. Uh, way out there in kind of these servers and all sort of reports get generated, how many faults happen and stuff like that. But at the edges, uh, it's relatively simple, simple, yeah, simple programming style. Okay, so uh, uh, there are, uh, since, since these things are so uh, uh, sort of uh, they have penetrated the industry, I mean uh, um, uh, extremely heavily. So there are standards naturally and there are five programming languages which are standardized by that IEC 61131 standard and they basically correspond to a mix of programming styles that you might imagine that one could do for something like this, some visual and some textual. So I have shown a couple of them out here which are the visual variety. So uh, uh, one is called ladder logic and essentially what is happening is it is showing you different paths through, so think of this like P equal to 0. This is equal to kind of frame and then each one of these paths basically correspond to one input to output kind of a relationship and uh, it would have like this is saying beat the sensor, enable something, blah, blah, some, some operations and all. So it's kind of a visual programming style. And function block diagram uh, is, looks very much like your Simulink kind of programming style or like you use Simulink or any other similar visual data flow kind of stuff. There are textual stuff also. Some structured text, there is a, something called instruction list which is kind of a more lower level type programming style and then sequential function graphics which I don't know but these are pretty archaic I mean much of the stuff you are talking about kind of started out uh, uh, decades ago, 70s, 80s and all and remember these are also one, one thing I forgot, these are also computers whose longevity is tremendous. I mean this factory gets built and then for um, runs for many decades so these PLCs haven't changed a whole lot. Uh, they write the technology curve, but uh, are pretty are, um, uh, uh, pretty sort of uh, tend to be pretty stable in terms of what uh, they look like. So they suffer for uh, these industrial control systems suffer from a variety of uh, uh, vulnerabilities as you might imagine. Some of them purely arise arri from policy and procedure. That's the equivalent of saying. I configured my firewall incorrectly in this particular case, uh, there are similar like who is authorized to access a particular actuator, those kind of things if you accidentally expose them. Uh, in some cases also some of the servers and all, if they are not given the right uh, control mechanism, so usually which sensor is allowed to talk to the database, which user is trying to if connect to the database. So for example, uh, some of my students we have occasionally tried to work with the UCLA facilities to get access to the sensor data that uh, sensor and actuator uh, at various buildings and also they expose them through a variety of proxies and controls and all. It's not like they just kind of log in and also lots of standard information security type uh, things. So some vulnerabilities arise simply from that and some accidents have happened as a result of that as well. So I think some company, I forget uh, uh, one of the uh, department stores. They were broken in because their HVAC systems servers were misconfigured and once they got in through that and I think then yeah, it kind of spread to the network. Then there are vulnerabilities which are specific to the platform and uh, 
you know, exploiting things. I mean, you know, a lot of the computers and these things, what the PLCs, what the rest of the computers are, Windows computers, and you know, whatever vulnerabilities come with those. Uh, when Ben talks about Stuxnet, you would see that that, that was part of attack vector. And then finally, uh, network vulnerabilities, uh, that has, so they have become particularly important as things are becoming more and more interconnected. So, when it comes to the net network, so we are referring to kind of now sort of uh, the multiple places where kind of their network connectivity. So, there is from PLCs to kind of the various servers and then, uh, then to the broader wider world within the organization. Uh, when it comes to how PLCs talk to uh, the rest of the stuff, there are uh, some very specific industrial networks which kind of exist. One workhorse protocol out here is something called Modbus. It's basically a very simple data transfer protocol. This is how, uh, for example, a lot of smart meters uh, and all that you get, they basically talk using Modbus and a, and a lot of devices are out, out there like this. And in, in, in the early days, it used to be that they would talk using RS-232 or RS-422, um, anyone knows RS-422, heard of it? It is a serial bus which is a multi master bus as opposed to RS-232 which is a one to one. So, uh, so basically you will have these sort of telephone wire type stuff running through the, this, the uh, pretty low data rate uh, and things would work over that. Um, what changed in recent times is that uh, a lot of these systems migrated to sending Modbus type data, but over TCP IP. So, what you see now increasingly is uh, that either they will have Ethernet interfaces or you can buy these what so called serial servers. So, they kind of talk to your let us say smart meter using a serial device and on the other side they have standard TCP IP interface and then now you are in the world of our regular uh, internet style um, uh, communication. Uh, so, Modbus TCP is out there and in fact there are lots of apps and all if you just go to like Google Play Store or Apple App Store uh, type Modbus you will see kind of tons of uh, tons of apps and all which are designed for monitoring and sort of talking to these kind of devices. So, essentially uh, one of the other things that changed with Modbus was that now since uh, you are in kind of a richer world of communication. So, you have all sort of communication multiple masters being able to talk exposing these things as restful web APIs all, all those kind of things have uh, begun to happen begin to happen. But it also obviously comes at a cost because now you have the exposure to a uh, wider um, uh, world with all sort of issues that uh, sort of uh, the hackers exploit. Um, uh, with TCP IP. There are some other more modern protocols and then there are also some industry specific protocols uh, which have emerged in this space. Um, one which is used quite extensively in the US is this thing called DNP3, it is again sort of acronyms from industry uh, industries, but there are a whole bunch of other stuff also. There are things uh, uh, catering to wireless, um, things catering to very tight timing requirements, so there are all sort of industrial uh, protocols which have emerged and kind of there is a mishmash of things. If you are into kind of uh, uh, the network within these, there are other things like there are uh, very, there is synchronous versions of Ethernet. So, like the entire Ethernet is like the communication in Ethernet is normally kind of this uh, CSMA type stuff, so contention based, but there are also versions of Ethernet which are designed for low jitter and so they are used in the industry like places like Disneyland and all kind of use them. So, there are all sort of these things, but um, in perhaps the most common uh, protocol you will find uh, or networking uh, protocol you will find is this DNP3 and DNP3 is designed uh, for a multi hop kind of a configuration which kind of looks like uh, sorry I think a uh, bit of an animation issue. Uh, so, it is a multi master kind of protocol. So, that is often used uh, again like I said there are industry segment specific things that kind of exist. Having said all of this 
while the networking technology is uh, advanced with DNP3 being the latest standard, it still has limitations. And the main thing again is goes back to this thing, the mindset behind a lot of these things still has been safety. And certainly given the setting they operate in, that is extremely important. Uh, but it is quite uh, common that you would not find uh, support for uh, key things that uh, from a security perspective are important and that includes encryption and authentication. So, I mean those are two sort of building blocks of designing a secure system. Now, the latest DNP3 standards for example, do, do have authentication. So, authentication basically refers to that can be validated. this is a device or the user which claims uh, claims to be it so, so that you can prevent spoofing attacks and those kind of things. Um, uh, but uh, they still do not have um, uh, encryption so there is no confidentiality. Now you might imagine that in this kind of a setting perhaps confidentiality is not important. Uh, but people have also shown that there are lots of attacks which uh, can leverage the lack of confidentiality. For example, if there is no confidentiality that by snooping on the traffic you can begin to identify uh, which address belongs to a particular actuator or a particular sensor and then you can mount a targeted denial of service attack by flooding on that address. So, so that um, you, know, you have a higher chance of getting successful both in terms of not being detected and then really focusing your effort on a particular sensor. So, without confidentiality, uh, you are opening yourself up to attacks which will exploit other weaknesses in your system. So, that's, that's, that's where sort of uh, these things currently uh, kind of stand that there are uh, these again because of the slow pace of this industry, a lot of uh, technological. So, firstly they use different stuff and you could uh, but it is not exactly terribly secret what it is. I mean these are all standards which are documented. So, their pace in terms of adopting the latest security stuff and all tends to be uh, less so. PLCs are extremely resource challenged. So, a lot of stuff that we are used to uh, in high end computing are not present there. Um, and also uh, the software operating systems stuff like that which often get, get used they are kind of rarely patched updated because the life cycle here is just so very different and the deployment environment stability matters a lot to them. So, it is not like every time a patch comes down we immediately install it, it needs to be cert validated, certified before you kind of roll it out because the danger of and also remember uh, the other thing is we can apply, we can stop using our phone for a bit and apply the patch. It is very hard to apply a patch to something controlling traffic light on a busy intersection. You have to schedule it carefully and all. So, these are running deployed systems and one has to, uh, so just, just the update uh, is kind of not, not easily done. So, lots of factors just basically make this corner of the world a bit uh, challenging. Uh, uh, real time requirements uh, come into play, continuous availability that is the point I just made which is in many cases zero downtime. Uh, the focus I think I think I think this misguided security perception is a very important point that these systems have historically been designed by people who are never trained in security in many any shape and form. And I think I think um, in coming years you will see this thing kind of dis, uh, disappear. I think the very naive view of security that sort of currently kind of exists. Uh, commercial off the shelf hardware and software, a uh, lot of them again not very well maintained and all interconnectivity and internet accessibility while providing additional interesting features and all are also opening up to other types of attacks. So, if you read kind of the literature in this field and all the holy grail uh, in you, if you may in terms of the attacks really or the concerns and all have been about the electric grid. Uh, particular uh, you, you would have heard the term smart grid in recent years and that is basically generically referring to that what used to be uh, kind of a grid which was primarily about moving energy now has an overlay of a data network in computing which is monitoring it and controlling things and relays are being controlled and a fault appears and then reactive actions gets taken. So, uh, some countries are even much much farther ahead than 
uh, US, like for example, Chinese electric grid is extremely advanced, US is relatively lagging uh, in, uh, in that regard. Uh, the problem with grids is that uh, stability uh, requirements are extremely tight and things go through remote places and uh, uh, all sort of attacks. I mean, there's obviously natural faults and all happening, but there are all sort of attacks. So, there are already, um, if something bad happens, then the effect can very rapidly propagate all through. So, uh, some many years ago, there was a huge blackout in Northeast triggered by some event in Canada slash another New York. And the thing is a fault and if something fails to react to it or if you do not have the right error fault, it can just basically have a cascading effect and can bring down uh, kind of the entire grid system because everything runs in synchrony, Gen all the generators are synchronized and so any any of these impact. So, uh, so the type of attack uh, possibilities have increased tremendously and there have already been attacks. So, there is something called Aurora attack which uh, gained a lot of attention where basically a failure was induced by repeatedly cycling a grid on and off. Okay, So, the way these grids work is that you have to have a match of energy inflow, energy outflow. So, if suddenly there is more load on the grid, then the generators in a way kind of begin to slow down, they are seeing more load. So, their frequency changes from 60 hertz and then that can begin to have problems. So, then there are local governors which basically begin to uh, address that or new generators come into the grid to kind of take care of that load. So, very important to have the whole energy flow kind of be stable and convergent. Yeah. If you had everyone in the US plugging their phones at the same time? Your phones do not consume anything. Yeah. Yeah. All the phones and all the oh, yeah. But the type of attacks people have speculated are what if uh, all the ACs are turned off simultaneously or all the heaters, those kind of things, those kind of loads can and in fact speculations even the Enron style stuff, those of you who are new to this country, some I guess when was it like uh, 1990s or no, in the early 2000s this company called Enron, they kind of got into manipulating the energy market uh, to make money of it because uh, by manipulating the market, they would basically sit between the generators and the, the people who own the generating stations and utilities who buy. And so, there were spot prices of electricity which has skyrocketed. So, those kind of manipulations have been speculated that uh, can be done with these kind of antics like what you are suggesting, not the phones, but certainly other things. So, uh, so in this particular case, uh, by manipulating the generator's connectivity to the grid, uh, this kind of attack was mounted. But there are all sorts of other scenarios. So, utilities naturally are quite paranoid because once the grid goes down, booting it back up is non-trivial also because one by one generators have to come up and synchronize and also it is very easy to bring it down, very hard to kind of bring it back up. So, there are lots of studies into like how things cascade how can we prevent it. Um, and as you could see from one of the bullets out there, the US electric grid is just three grids, okay. They meet at certain points, but basically, I mean like the entire West Coast, I mean you are talking about huge whatever, these grids are serving um, 100 million plus people in one go. So, the effect are quite sort of catastrophic and needless to say, a uh, lot of safety issues and all uh, which come with it. So, uh, as part of this whole smart grid stuff, what is happening is that uh, these sensors called PMUs, uh, phaser metabolic units, are getting uh, inserted in a variety of places. And what these PMUs do is they continually monitor at that point in the grid <coughs> what um, yeah, the flow of electricity is. In effect, what they do is they monitor the AC current and the AC voltage. So, these are kind of that is what is called as phaser. What is the phase? What is the amplitude? You have three voltage phases, you have three. Uh, current phases, so you are kind of measuring uh, those vectors. And uh, uh, this, this, this stuff, I guess, um, uh, I think it came out of research at Virginia Tech many years ago. And these are essentially uh, sensors which sense the AC cycle. Uh, AC cycle is 16 millisecond. I believe the sample this AC cycle 48 times, if I recall my numbers right, and they do it in synchrony. That is the same sample is taken identically all over the grid. So, to achieve that level of synchronization, 
they use GPS. So each PMU has a GPS attached to it. It's being used not for location, but for timing. So GPS gives you some, let's say, order of 10 nanosecond type timing, which is good enough for this, uh, uh, plenty good enough for it. And by looking at these things now uh, from these PMU measurements, they get a very early warning of, is there a fault? Like, for example, maybe a tree branch falls on something, or the line goes down, uh, or perhaps some deliberate sabotage happens. So this those kind of things. And then, um, uh, and then they have to take corrective action. So I recall there was a talk by Southern California Edison, VP of Engineering in our department some years ago. And we had said that they basically have three AC cycles to take corrective action. So three AC cycles, to put it in perspective, is basically 50 milliseconds. So within 50 milliseconds, they have to take corrective action. And if the adversary is able to fool your notion of where the attack is or delay report about the attack, then basically the grid has a cascading effect. So, uh, so this is an example of a system where uh, timeliness is important, correctness is important by manipulating the GPS, the same kind of weakening and GPS denial attacks and all, you can mess with the PMUs and then cause problem. You can misdirect the report as to where the, uh, uh, where the uh, fault has occurred. So the corrective action is not, uh, in corrective action, all that's happening is you're trying to isolate that area. So you're going to basically prevent, um, like uh, isolate as in kind of do a deliberate blackout in that area so that uh, uh, you, you, you have, uh, you keep the grid safe. So that's, that's what's happening and this is, this is an example of a uh, system where uh, tremendous concerns have emerged. Um, smart meters. Uh, uh, are being deployed. Now part of the thing, uh, I mean we all think of smart meters purely in terms of that uh, they are being used for billing and that they don't have to come to your home and all. But smart meters play a much bigger role in the modern electric grid. So what current smart meters do is they uh, essentially report energy consumption back to the utility every 15 minutes or so. Okay. And kind of the idea is, and, and some of them, uh, the samples are really high rate. And the idea is, obviously, this is being used for billing, but the billing happens every month or every two months. So that can't be the whole purpose. Uh, so what else do you think they're used for, this information? Why do why do the sample at 15 minutes or 15, actually, I'm sorry, it's 15 seconds. Uh, so why, why do you think a smart meter would sample data at a high rate? What else would it be doing? Billing would suffice yeah, once a month. Speculations? Huh? No, no, why would utility want to mount an attack? Right? So they are putting these meters and sampling at such a high rate. And yet, meters we not think in terms of how oh, that's for billing. Uh, hmm? Yeah, so account for surges, so they are keeping a tab, like, uh, so you can think of them as they are kind of like the PMU sitting at the very edge, they are sensors sitting at the very edge. So as uh, sudden surges begin to happen for whatever reason, they can detect it and kind of take corrective action. So they are getting a better insight into the state of the grid. What else? Yeah, so they can begin to check for pilfering. Uh, cheating, okay, those kind of things can begin to happen. One form of cheating is the following, it's very common now in many places, parts of the country, where you get rates which are dependent upon time of use. So like for example, you would promise not to use certain types of loads at certain times of day. Like you would say, we'll run the heavy load only at night, uh, right? Or uh, so those, those kind of things, so again, monitoring continual stuff, they catch because you're, you're agreeing to a rate agreement and then you're violating it. Uh, I mean, some people are also producing electricity. That, that is true as well. But that could, you could imagine that the backflow of electricity and that could be accounted for. Um, but uh, again, there also, the thing is that the compensation they are offered for backflow of the energy they are generating into the grid often depends upon time of day. So like the, 
utility will pay you more if they are short of energy. If on the other hand, they already have an excess of energy, then they won't pay you, right? So, so this time of use based pricing structures and all also kind of help. Uh, but the thing is they introduce these very same things. I mean, now introducing also uh, threats also. The metering fraud, privacy concerns as a sort of uh, issue. And then also by manipulating the data out here, if the utility is now using it for uh, as part of their control in the grid, then you can also have grid stability concerns. Also, utility uses these things for prediction purposes, like how much would the load be? And uh, normally they would have insight only at the level of kind of their substation level, but now they can begin to have insights at a final granularity and thereby have better predictions. They need that because there is an electricity market where uh, the pricing is decided based upon, much like uh, we purchase stocks and all or commodities or Chicago commodity exchange, same, same thing happens with energy. So uh, there is a, a set of buyers and uh, suppliers and they meet. And also a funky things can happen in this market also. And like for example, in Europe, oftentimes now energy has in many places has gone negative as in you are paid to consume energy, paid to consume electricity. So that's a sweet deal, right? I mean, utility tells you, uh, run your load and we're gonna pay you money. Why do you think that happens? Right, and it's cost too much to bring the source down and restart it. So they might as well pay you, right? So. So these are all, uh, you probably heard this term, demand response uh, management and all, they're all part of that game, but all these things are creating these concerns. Other concerns, uh, jamming attacks, DPS spoofing, this is actually a serious real concern because PMUs have in, sort of penetrated the grids tremendously and so there are backups to GPS being talked about that you connect, have some other additional network to kind of provide these things. Um, so in preparation of handing over to Ben, uh, perhaps uh, the most prominent uh, industrial control system attack uh, ever really has been this so-called Stuxnet, which I think took place in what, 2008 or nine or something like that, around 2009. Um, it was basically an attack on Iran's uh, nuclear enrichment facilities. And uh, essentially kind of the history behind this is that um, uh, Iran and US or, uh, used to be friends. And so uh, lots of whatever technology transfer happened in those days and all. And then they turned, uh, as we all know, in 1970s, kind of uh, against each other. And then after, but meanwhile, all this stuff was sitting there. So uh, Iran uh, needed, so, so Iran no longer got the uranium that they needed to run the power plants. So they needed to uh, enrich their own. Of course, there's also the further thing that uh, would they, after enriching it, would they, were they also using that and this stuff to make bombs, okay? So both, both those stuff were there. So they basically had these factories in effect, uh, which uh, whose purpose was to enrich uranium 238 uh, to 235. Uh, and basically what happens in this thing is these are centrifuges, which are basically very rapidly, very high rate rotating machineries and uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, supply of one type of uranium comes one way and then kind of separation happens and then things go out. So you have a higher concentration of desired, desired type of uranium, uh, uranium, uranium atoms. Uh, so that's, that's what's happening and these things are controlled by PLCs, uh, much like those SCADA type systems that I showed, okay. Very typical of any, any chemical processing factory that you would see. So nothing terribly special about it. And in fact, pretty old uh, technology because remember their supply for new technology kind of dried up. And uh, so, yeah, uh, so a lot of them is very well known stuff. I will not go into the details because that's what Ben will do, but um, sort of, uh, uh, it got a lot of attention, uh, partly because who conducted the attack, uh, 
but also because there were ramifications beyond Iran. It's very hard to contain these kind of attacks. Um, I remember, um, I mean, probably most of you were not born. So when I was a grad student in late 1980s, one fine day, the internet went down. Okay, and this was the famous uh, worm, uh, which basically went awry because a graduate student turned out at MIT uh, was conducting an experiment and uh, on this like he was trying out an idea on how to design a worm and kind of it just spread. Uh, nice thing is that he is an MIT professor at this point or a Harvard professor, I forget, I think MIT professor. Uh, so yeah, having, taking, taking, uh, Trying out things perhaps pays off also. Anyway, uh, so in this particular case, lots of centrifuges were damaged, and I guess um, uh, how much the Iranian program was pushed back and all is subject of debate and perhaps irrelevant, uh, but it's how the attack was mounted, which is kind of the more interesting uh, piece. So I want to stop here and have Ben take over, but since it's almost close to five, so let's take a quick four or five minute break while. I transition over to Ben. So. Um, I have a small clarification. The document, the sem uh, semantics dossier in itself, hmm? uh, look like kind of an analysis. And someone on house also posted a question on the other. So should the analysis be about more about how the document was structured? Yeah, it's about the paper. It's like. I guess uh, it's an analysis, so I know it's not their own work, so you can't really kind of talk about that. Because I've, I've written a little bit about the document in itself and the, how the attack was carried out. Should, should that be fine? Yeah, that's fine. Don't, don't worry. This is an unusual paper, so yeah. don't worry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't know what you're doing. I mean, I, I don't know how come all your absences are just synchronizing with this class. Hmm? This is my last one. I know it's your last quarter, but I mean that's that's uh, you need to take the course seriously. <laughs> I mean, remember last quarter it was E297, and I recall you were again in the same boat. So what's going on? We gave you a break in E297. You recall, right? I mean, uh, and now you are again doing the same thing here. Okay, this is a last allowed absence, uh, uh, but I am going to talk, I mean three, three absences out of 20 lectures is way too much. Yeah, sure. Okay. So, uh, yeah, because I mean, this is the, uh, and, and, and you know, I, we had this conversation in E297 also. Remember, you said I'm getting A's and A pluses. I can't afford a U, even if it looks. And we gave you a break, right? We gave you an S, even though it was going to be a U. And you are repeating exactly the same thing again this quarter, right? Look, part of the deal of taking a course is you go to attend it. Yeah, sure, okay. sure. Yes, please do. No more absences. Okay. Okay. Sure. Yeah, and uh, Prof Professor, if, if I just have one last request, if possible, can I um, get more time to prepare for the table presentation for you? I think I'd have to have a No, it will, uh, you are going to be scheduled for next Tuesday or move it to Thursday? Thursday. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. <coughs> but it will be a different paper, not that paper. That paper, I'm um, right. So I will announce the paper.
Yeah. Uh, just let you know, we might choose the uh, uh, home activity. What's your project? Uh, the wireless one or the, yeah, the wireless okay. uh, sniffing was okay. SDR. Okay. So I, yeah. I wonder, when should we... I know there are the second group who also wants to do it, but okay. that's fine. Okay. okay. So yeah. I wonder, when should we uh, give out the abstract or something? I think more important is figure out what you need. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we, we were trying to figure it out. Yeah. Um, Okay. Speaking. Yeah. What you need, as in, as what needs to be purchased. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Next up. Might just need a Raspberry Pi and some software distribution. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, okay, so uh, let's start. So, uh, Ben is going to talk about how the Stuxnet was actually uh, structured and what happened there. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Ben. Uh, I'm here to talk about Stuxnet virus. And I'll start off by saying sorry if none of you wanted to read the 70-page document instead of the 30-page one, but I really don't like the 30-page one, so it's hard to follow. Um, so for some background on it, it was basically a computer virus, as we just talked about a second ago. Um, it was suspected development by the US and Israel as sort of like a cyber warfare scheme. Um, that's based on a bunch of circumstantial evidence, but it, there aren't really any other reasonable suspects. So it targets industrial um, SCADA and PLC systems that control the nuclear centrifuges in Iran. And it did this by infecting the Windows computers that uh, programmed them, and then intercept the communications between the Windows computers and the PLCs that were being programmed. Um, it caused extensive damage to Iran's nuclear program. Uh, so it destroyed, I think, a thousand centrifuges. And it also had some communication to the outside. So it reported data about their nuclear development efforts back to whoever the attacker was. And um, some reports estimate that up to a fifth of the nuclear program was damaged in this. I know the professor said it wasn't very significant before, but that made it seem significant. But yeah, it infected over 200,000 computers and caused around 1,000 machines to degrade, and it spread indiscriminately. And part of the reason for this is that the Windows computers that program these PLCs in the industrial environment are normally offline. So they're actually very hard to reach. So it just had to infect every computer it came into contact with until it found a computer with the correct software on it. Um, so here it shows like the geographic distribution of all of them. This is from a uh, semantic from that paper, and they analyzed about 40,000 known cases of Stuxnet and showed where they fell. 
So even if it was originally just released in Iran or somewhere near it, it kind of spread all around the world. You can see even places like the U.S. and um, Russia and Great Britain were infected by it. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the architecture of Stuxnet and how it works, because that's what the main meat of the paper was. So for the components of it, um, the main one was the DLL file. And for people who aren't familiar with that, it's basically a Windows construct. And it's just a dynamically linked library where it's a bunch of executable code. And um, pieces of the executable code can be called by outside processes. And then that code executes with the same memory and um, privileges that the calling process has. So that's important for the Stuxnet's execution. Um, it had a wrapper program, which basically just installed it on whatever computer it found itself on. Um, it used a pretty unique code injection technique, which I'll talk about later. It used that to hijack processes. Um, I think the two most interesting parts of it were actually the zero-day vulnerabilities it used to escalate its privileges, and then what was called a Windows rootkit. And that kind of interfered with the Windows operating system so that the files of Stuxnet themselves weren't able to be seen. Um, it had a compromised security certificate as well, and if you remember when we talked about security certificates earlier this quarter, it's basically a certificate that says this driver, this piece of software is from a trusted source, and it's given by like um, some kind of cybersecurity firm or something, so that you know that the computer can trust that code. And so if the certificate is compromised, then your computer is without bounds trusting malicious code. How did they do that? I mean, one day for who's that? Some certificate or? Uh, it didn't seem like it. Once they got like kind of post-mortem Stuxnet analysis, they found the security certificate and reported it. And then the security firm was Realtek, I think. And then they reported it compromised and devalidated it after that. So I don't know how they initially got it. But um, let's talk about the propagation. Because like I said, it had to spread really fast over both the network and removable drives to get to the offline computers. And then um, command and control is how it basically communicated with the outside world. And then finally, we'll talk about the PLC attacks where it actually destroyed the centrifuges. So to really take over the DLL wrapper program, uh, the wrapper contains the DLL, extracted it from itself, and put it in memory and calls one of the exports in the DLL. And basically, the exports in the DLL are just all the individual functions that can be called individually within it. And every time a new export is called, um, the entire DLL is copied into memory again, and then um, the export in that is called. And uh, this makes it so that each function has access to the entire program, so it can copy it wherever. And also remember that um, since the DLL executes in the privilege mode of the calling process, once you get into administrator once, you're in it for forever. It keeps calling itself. Um, it modifies like Windows DLL by, to bypass behavior blocking, which normally prevents like unauthorized or suspect calls of dynamically linked libraries. And it does this by, um, it kind of hooks into it and modifies it so that when you call it and it fails, it just calls Stuxnet. And it can't block it. Um, for the code injection technique, this was a little confusing when I first read it. It basically um, scans the whole system that it's on for which antivirus software is on it. And then depending on that antivirus software, it picks one executable that it knows is uh, compromisable on the computer. And what it does is it creates that process in suspended form, and then removes it from memory and replaces it with a Stuxnet executable at the same address. Um, it allocates a bunch of empty space at the beginning of it, and then it knows where the entry point of that specific executable is. And where that entry point is, it just places a jump to the Stuxnet code. Um, yeah, and that, that gets around the behavior blocking of calling the DLO. Okay, so what's the Behavior blocking. Um, so it seems like it's a security practice that Windows uses and maybe other operating systems. I started about it for Windows. I guess in this instance, it's specifically for Windows because it has to do with a dynamically linked library. But normally, um, executables and dynamically linked libraries that aren't normally associated can't be called, or that communication can't happen. So if you have a random program just randomly call the Stuxnet DLL, that would be flagged as suspect by the Windows operating system, and it would block that call. <clears throat> so for the zero-day vulnerabilities, these are actually errors in the Windows 32 operating system that um, were undisclosed when Stuxnet was released, so they may not have even been discovered. But I thought this was one of the most interesting parts. Um, so this uh, one was used to escalate the privilege to administrator mode of the program. And what it did is it called a system process, and that had a function table in it. And a function table is basically just a table of addresses, which the path of execution is going to jump to. 
So basically, you get an index into the table. It goes to that space in the table, reads the address, and jumps to that location of memory. Um, they noticed that in this particular process, the input was not validated. So basically, in good C fashion, you could put in a bound that went way over the end of the function table, and it would just find whatever address is at that location and jump to it. Um, so what Stuxnet would do is it would look at this function table and then look at all the data after it in memory. And it would find an address in that memory that they could map um, Stuxnet to, basically, or that they could put code into. So they would find an address that contained an area of memory that was accessible to them. So they would put shell code there that would execute Stuxnet and then drop a keyboard layout that was uh, malicious into a Windows folder. And that malicious keyboard layout had a byte in it that caused the function pointer to go past the end of the table to that specific address where it jumped to code that executed um, Stuxnet. And it was from the sh or it was shell code that executed Stuxnet, so then it was an administrator. Um, so the load point for Stuxnet, uh, it had a driver, and this was the one that was digitally signed with the compromised uh, real text certificate. So that the computer trusted the driver, and it was also or also included with it was a registry key that registered it as a boot service, and it was able to do that with the compromised security certificate. So from then on out, any machine that had Stuxnet on it, when the computer was booted up, uh, it would execute Stuxnet on boot. For command and control, um, one of the exports in the Stuxnet DLL opened a server on port 80 for communication, and it used HTTP to communicate to some. It looked like the names of the DNS um, website was just like today's premier football or something like that that was supposed to be inconspicuous. And um, it basically relayed information about the computer to the attacker, including OS version flags, um, what domain it's on, and if it had software to program the PLCs. And from this, they were able to kind of gain information about the whole network of computers in the attack zone. <coughs> So the Windows rootkit was pretty interesting. Um, this also used the compromised certificate. Yeah? Uh, it didn't seem like that, because I think they also knew that Stuxnet was going to end up being um, like on a lot of offline computers. So once it eventually found itself on the offline computer with the PLC software, then it had to attack it regardless. But one of the things they could do is also like update Stuxnet remotely. So they would create new versions and put it. And then um, as we talked about in the propagation method, once one's updated, if it sees other computers that also have Stuxnet on it, then it will um, then it'll like update it to the newest version. And the server was also used for communication just between the uh, infected computers, not necessarily out to the outside world. So the Windows rootkit was also pretty interesting. This used the same uh, compromised certificate to create a driver. And it basically created a new device in the Windows device chain. And what this did was it would intercept read requests going to the directory, to the file system. And it would um, so it'd re see that there was a read request and modify the data going out to hide any file that matched certain parameters that made them a Stuxnet file. And this made it so that um, whenever you query a directory, you don't see the Stuxnet files in it. So if your computer was infected, then you plugged the or, and you had the USB in it, you wouldn't be able to see it on the USB, and you wouldn't be able to see any files on your local machine either. And this includes basically like using explorer.exe to browse files or using the DIR in the command window or any um, program that looked for it. So it had a pretty advanced propagation system. Um, it could propagate across the network. Uh, so one of the ways is peer-to-peer, -peer, and this was the way that it kind of, uh, it would basically, on that port that it opened earlier, communicate with other computers that were infected with Stuxnet and ask for its version number. And if either of them, or if they were different, then the computer that had the lower version number would update to the newest version of Stuxnet. Um, it had a way that it would attack the WinCC databases with malicious SQL code and put itself in the database and then also infect other computers to use it. Um, through network shares and like um, the ne like network LAN drives on a Windows, it could propagate through those. Print spooler zero day vulnerability, it didn't go into too much, so I don't really understand, but that was also a way that it infected other computers on a LAN network with it. 
and also uh, some Windows Server service that performs some general maintenance that could attack that and infect the Windows Server. So it propagated through the network that way, but its primary method of propagation was through the removable drive. And this was the one where every time you plugged a uh, removable drive into your computer, Stuxnet would see that one was plugged in, and it would copy itself over to it, and then use the Windows rootkit to hide the fact that it was on it. Um, it went to prevent detection, if more than three computer or if three computers were infected with the same removable drive, they would see that in some configuration file it had on that and delete Stuxnet off it, so you, they couldn't analyze the drive after noticing a couple infected computers. Um, it also executed when you, the second you plugged in the um, flash drive and opened it, it would execute the Stuxnet installation. And it did that through like a modified auto run file in the directory. And then I saw that it also had another method of getting people to install Stuxnet, which I posted a picture of, so it was interesting, where it basically had execute auto run um, in the context menu and then changed what that looked like when you opened it. So there were two open tags. And clicking the second open one would just automatically install Stuxnet. That'd be like strange if someone like looked at that and saw two open things. Like, would that be very? Yeah, but I think I would assume that Windows is buggy and not that it's malicious. But I'd probably get a computer no, virus. I've never seen that <laughs> in my entire life. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely more suspicious. I think the like auto run capability is probably better. <laughs> um, and also, it had another simpler way of hiding the files on the flash drive when you plugged it into a new computer that didn't have the root kit installed, but. It, I didn't really go into that in depth. It was supposed to be less robust than the rootkit version. So for the last part, we'll talk about how it actually destroyed the centrifuges. So once it got onto a computer, it would scan it for certain, it was called step seven software, and that's what they use. It's the specific software used to program these programmable logic controllers. And if they found that software on it, it would replace the vendor DLL that it used with its own. And this is the this DLL was used for communication between the Windows computer and the PLC, and so it would basically intercept every communicate or whenever you like try to write code to the controller, um, this DLL, the malicious one, would intercept that. It could read all the code that you're trying to send to it, and it could also insert its own code into it or modify any values. And if you're ever trying to read code back from the controller to like debug it or see what's going on, it could intercept the code coming back, remove all the Stuxnet code, and then send it back to you. So you had no idea what was going on. Um, it basically looked for the frequency converter drives in these centrifuges, and those contained like maximum values. And it could alter this maximum value to make the centrifuges spin faster than they were supposed to, and this would damage them. And it could also insert like a routine that was a thread that basically made them speed up and slow down drastically over and over until that damaged them. Um, the threads and the malicious code that it put on that were actually pretty complicated. It had a big state machine where it would wait until certain conditions are met. After that, it would um, wait like two hours and then start attacking the machine. And then once it deemed the attack was done, it would go dormant for like some amount of time that was calculated. And then it would try again if the machine wasn't destroyed. And uh, that's pretty much it. I didn't have too much on strengths or weaknesses of the two papers. Um, the shorter paper seems like it summarized the semantic one kind of badly by being very high level and at the same time just throwing a bunch of code snippets in there that didn't make much sense. And then the semantic one was more of just an overview, so I don't really have anything about their methodology to critique. So wanted to add uh, one more thing. So they also made sure that the operator would keep getting the correct reading. Mm -hmm. So like the display which showed like what speed the centrifuges were doing and all. So the computer they infected, the Windows computer is what the operator like the code is, mm -hmm. but that's also the one that received the status. Yeah. And so basically it arranged, so it infected the firmware for the PLCs, but and yet the operator would see as if everything was in the way. So mm -hmm. that's, that's what's fine. So instead of strengths and weaknesses, let me ask the following. So what do you guys think are the defensive arrangements? How would you go around defending them? Yeah, you know, but you know, that's easier said than none, right? I mean, you're basically saying maintain the Windows properly, right? I mean, that's what you're saying. At least, at least for the flashing computer, like those are the critical ones. Without those, you won't get into Yeah, but remember in this case, they're exploiting 
vulnerability in yeah, uh, the OS, which uh, probably even Microsoft didn't know about, right? I mean, so. Uh, there was the one with the version of the one that was on the There were like four different vulnerabilities that they exploited, and I think only one of them needed to work yeah. for it. Uh, actually those are all yeah. so, uh, so generally, when faced with something like this, okay, so since since Dustnet, a lot of work has happened on defending against these kind of things also, and uh, it has generally gone in the direction. So look, saying that we will be able to protect the Windows machine to the extent that uh, such compromise may not. Okay, it's easier said than done because they're basically saying I'll have a, a, a correct installation of uh, you know, that's, 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 that's really what they want. So uh, some of the approaches that have emerged is what they do is they basically intercept the firmware which is going from the HMI machine to okay, and then they analyze the firmware. Literally they decompile, they verify, formally verify as to its safety properties. Like for example, um, since it was modifying the MAC frequency, then you would say, okay, that's just controllable, reverse end violating bounds, and then you prevent it moving forward. So these guys are analyzing and modifying the code, these guys are reversing it. Okay, so that's one kind of approach which has kind of emerged. An independent analyzer, man in the middle, better, I guess, uh, uh, analyzing this code and only then letting it go to the PLC. Um, the other is on the PLC side, you do protect that access, right? I mean, so you can be a processor, but it can be on the demand. Perhaps you have some sort of a defender thing sitting at the sensor slash actuator, and which is again kind of guarding the So you have to bring to bear, again, make it a multi layer security system because it would be very hard to just say, I'll just close windows so that this thing. Not, not just that, but I think like some places where they have this sort of system where you have. The only way to get to a computer is either through Windows drives like CDs, flash drives. They'll also have a parallel device, which is not Windows or anything else, it's very low level. It just analyzes the size, like, like size limits, like if you, you know, it's still possible to just by analyzing size, you could still perhaps remove some of their code and add some of your code and still keep the same size, but there's no way you could always have it function exactly the same. So uh, if you plug into that first, Check it before you plug it in. Right, except, except the thing is, look, I mean, I'm sure that must be, I mean, yeah. given the sensitivity of the system, I'm sure Iran, Iran had uh, protocols in place that you should not plug okay, unless you die from outside to and people basically do, right? I mean, yeah, so, even outside, even inside ones. Yeah, even so, ones. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, well, a combination of human error and vulnerability is uh, perhaps discovered year, years later. Always something. Anyway, I think these are messy problems. Okay, so I think uh, one of the things in security generally is you can't just rely on a single point of protection. I mean, it's going to be everything sort of connected. You can you can if the one foot fail and therefore what's your backup and protecting the system. So a bunch of stuff happening. Uh, thanks, man. So. Uh, mm -hmm. What, um, yeah, this paper was kind of an unusual one in the sense that, yeah, I realize there's no, uh, yeah, other than that, that the paper I, yeah, I'll come to, yeah, the paper I had selected was very poorly written. So uh, I think the semantic one was written by people in America. So it was properly written. Uh, yeah, Nathan. I wanted to ask, since security is very dominant, is it still out there and should it be out? Is it in a kind of cleanup of I think most places would have cleaned up particularly because it was uh, after the analysis it was shown it infected particular particular PLCs. Uh, so I think hopefully all those people did clean up. Yeah. Oh, now it is many years back. Yeah, so, uh, so I'm, I'm pretty sure. It, uh, like in the US, I think, I don't know, one of the papers said it was Chevron, I think, which was affected uh, by that. Yeah. Uh, so it, I mean, it did spread quite vastly. And you could see that the countries kind of in that Asian region were the one which were most impacted. Presumably, that's where that particular model of Siemens was being used uh, um, uh, much, much more so. So, uh, what I want to do now is to switch to the modern scores on kind of beginning to look at uh, specific uh, tools that 
uh, concepts that we bring to bear and one obviously is cryptography okay now crypt, uh, i mean cryptography and uh, um, uh, is, is just one part of the whole tool chain okay um, so i'll start on that and uh, um, let's see so we are, yeah go ahead yeah like they had stuff the ones who created stuffnet they actually had a set of conditions where it had checked whether the computer was mm -hmm. into bit and it kind of exited if it found that it was 64 bit and it, they also had certain specific dates around which they had centered the attack around but they didn't throw much light on what it actually meant except for one particular date Right. But it, it kind of checks whether the system is running this kind of data or it's... Yeah, look, look, some of those choices and all were never fully understood also, right? I mean, uh, in the sense that you are not trying to also divine about the goal and intent of the attacker. Uh, so some of these magical things are on. Also, the other thing is these these malware themselves are so immensely complicated that they make mistakes, okay? So, uh, like for example, uh, the malware which had attacked the webcams from China which was then used to mount a uh, denial of service attack on DNS service providers which was late 2016. Uh, it was uh, it was topped by basically uh, trapping its calls to the DNA. It, it was supposed to be kind of just like this one was calling out and it was calling out to a particular server and I think there was some error in that code and which is how kind of they ended up defending. So, uh, a lot of these things are hard to kind of fully understand also. Okay, so, the other thing is, I mean this concept of zero day vulnerability had, uh, were you guys familiar with it before? What does that mean? Day of the launch, or when someone is testing, like the one in Apple iPhone X, they found out that it couldn't unlock when the person who was supposed <laughs> to present it uh, because people had actually fidgeted around before the show, and then yeah. So, so, so uh, you're kind of on it, but not quite. So, zero day vulnerability means I buy a fresh product, it has I have not installed anything, this is as the manufacturer intended, and it has bugs. Okay, sometimes these bugs are unknown and most vendors run bounty programs. Apple has it, Microsoft has it and all. So, and some of them are pretty depending upon the severity, you can make hundreds of thousands of dollars, okay. Uh, Google similarly offers a bounty program for their services and all, but the zero day specifically refers to you buy a new product as is, it has never been plugged into the internet, it has never been updated, nothing. What are the vulnerabilities in that? Uh, second term you would hear is air gapped computers. You know what that means? Huh? It's not connected to anything. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, critical infrastructure type stuff and all, hopefully, it would be air gapped uh, in the sense. So, it talks, it is surrounded by air with everything else relative to the physical world. That's, that's kind of the concept, right? Um, you would see in a lot of places, I mean, I have encountered these kind of uh, things also in my professional life for a variety of purposes, but attacks on them have also been done with a combination of zero day vulnerability and thing, okay? So, that's the other thing. Um, uh, there are also a products you can buy and all which seek to infiltrate like the connection between the mouse and the computer or the keyboard and the computer and stuff like that are like cables which look like just normal cables and in that tiny little connector at the end they would have a whole microcontroller and kind of doing funky stuff and all. There's a whole kind of uh, you can you can buy these things and all and in the Snowden papers uh, there was description of some of those designs by NSA also so th these kind of things exist. So the second. Third thing you heard the term rootkit out here. What does that refer to? Nope. No, 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 that's not rootkit. Okay, that will be part of a little homework. Okay, uh, I think I think these terms you should understand because um, uh, we are increasingly in an era where I mean, look, we are all in ECE or in your professional lives. You're going to face design systems and I think these are all attack vectors. Root kits are particularly pernicious things, okay. Uh, Ben's talk had a bit of a hint towards that, but basically in that case, because of the root kit, it was hiding some information from Inkseam. So, it kind of 
Um, so anyway, yeah, go Google, find out what it is. Okay, so uh, one thing then I want to spend some time on is crypto uh, a little bit. And uh, actually, my slide set is not complete, but I think we had the 530 points, so I think it's okay. Well, uh, uh, so what uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about is uh, we kind of loose. Uh, loosely, I mean, we all know of crypto and also, what, what does crypto do for us? Anyone? Like when you think of cryptography, what do you have in mind? What all things crypto enables, what does it do? Can't read, okay, so that's confidentiality, right? Okay. What else can it enable? What was the first thing you said? Can uh, uh, modify. modify? Yeah, so that's the other thing. So, here part you also said so confidentiality and integrity, right? So those are two things which comes to mind. Now, now cryptography normally, I mean, we just think of the science of coding, right? In some senses, um, but the two goals for our pur purposes tend to be no one can uh, confidentiality that no one can hear um, uh, or whatever can eavesdrop into. Uh, the content of our uh, messages and the other one is no one can modify it. There are additional things you can build upon to, on top of it like for example should not be able to repudiate. What I mean by that is I sent you something and then I deny it, right? That I deny that I sent it. So there could be other goals also but loosely speaking they are all based around kind of um, um, Kind of the science of or whatever, of, of taking things and encrypting them to into some form. Uh, so uh, what I did was I this, these slides just want to acknowledge they are actually adapted from a course at Stanford that a lecture overview of cryptography which I thought was pretty well done. So I'm just adapting a lot of material out of that. Uh, in, so uh, it's a great tool, but bear in mind uh, cryptography is just one aspect of security. So they're not synonymous and while uh, obviously cryptographers get a lot of attention, it's a very hard and foundational science uh, and so justifiably so, but from a systems perspective that's just one part of the overall, overall sorry, so very important to realize that. So it's not a solution to all security problems. It is not reliable unless it is implemented properly, that is also extremely important and it is not reliable unless it is used properly. Both these parts are important and a uh, corollary of all of these things is never implement your own encryption or your own crypt uh, cryptographic tools because uh, these things may seem deceptively simple, just bunch, we will see a bunch of XORs and stuff like that. But the problem is it's very hard to get them right and one of the reasons is very hard. So, so there is obviously an efficiency issue that is you want a lot of this stuff to be efficient and all. But also the other part is that an improperly done things can have subtle bugs, particularly bugs having to do with side channels. This is a concept we'll, we have sort of encountered before that is uh, uh, sort of it's not the primary communication channel but somehow the information about the system is being leaked or you have some other way of attacking the system. Uh, in case of uh, computation, the side channels refer to things like um, uh, uh, what can you learn by observing let us say the power consumption of the system okay? or the timing of the system, these kind of things. Some of these side channels are physical in nature as in the power for example or how much sound it is making or how much light it is emitting or stuff like that, uh, LED blinking patterns, those kind of things, they are all physical. And then there are also softer side channels. Uh, in particular, uh, I mean earlier in the course, I had, we had some discussion on kind of those recent uh, attacks on uh, processors uh, or whatever vulnerabilities in processors, meltdown and spectre. spectre. Uh, they are examples of softer side channels because in that case what is happening is that while the program works as intended in terms of how it affects the architectural state of a processor, namely the registers and stuff like that, it actually has a unintended side effect on the so called micro architectural state that is all those registers in a processor which you are not which are not visible to you through the instruction set architecture. So, these are 
the caches and the look aside buffers and pre branch predictors and all sort of stuff that a modern processor has for performance purposes. So when you run a program, your user and visible stuff may be affected, but it also affects that hidden state and a lot of these modern attacks are exploiting that footprint left on that microarchitectural state. Very hard to get these things right, uh, very easy to leak away information, so uh, you should use professionally designed uh, cryptographic libraries, not, not, not your own. Um, another thing which I said earlier today also, but it is called Kirchhoff's principle and this is actually at the heart of what at least for me has been a learning experience. I mean like all of you, I come from an EE background. I was never trained in security, but in whatever recent let us say 7, 8 years I have kind of gotten interested in this and self learned. Mm -hmm. And the big change in mindset is that security is not about noise, it is not about random failures, it is not, it is a very different thing. You are engaged in a game with an adversary and you should not um, artificially constrain that adversary. So when you are talking about security and cryptography specifically, you have to have a couple of things very well understood. What is your model of the adversary? That is what do you allow adversary to be able to do and know, okay? Like for example, what are the bounds on his or her computing power? What are, uh, what does the adversary know? What can the adversary do, right? All those kind of things and you have to have a, obviously a model which is realistic, right? I mean, uh, you know, for example, perhaps code with certain type can be broken with exhaustive search and others cannot even forcible technology advancements, okay. So this principle says the following that a crypto system should be secure even if everything about the system is known to the adversary. In fact, you have to assume that everything about the system is known to adversary. Um, uh, your algorithm cannot be secret, um, your protocol cannot be secret. The only thing you should, you are allowed to have a secret is the so-called secret key. This is specifically in context of cryptography. That is the key can be secret, but we still have to worry about it. How will you distribute or how will you have such a secret key? That is a practical concern. But other than that, so security by obscurity is not acceptable, okay? So that is another important point. So common uses of cryptography, uh, one is, and I guess when both of you gave the answer, you pretty much seem to have a mindset of communication and that is certainly uh, the most common use of cryptography. So uh, how do two entities communicate? A sensor talking to uh, cloud based web service for example. And there are two parts to it, right? I mean we have to encrypt, uh, decrypt kind of some sort of ch channel and then we need to have the shared key and a shared key which is secret. Uh, so encryption, decryption, that uh, that step two where you are encrypting the data and I guess is a side of decrypting it, so a browser talking to a server for example, that is one part of it, but then how do you set up that key to begin with and that is another part of it and this is the domain of step two is the domain of what is called a symmetric cryptography, shared key, shared secret, both parties, I lock it, this other side has a copy of the same key and then lock it and uh, step one is uh, that we should have some mechanism to set up that key properly, okay? Because otherwise, have this problem. How do I distribute this thing? Particularly if we'll have millions of these sensors and all. How do we go around? Uh, uh, so key management step one is actually a pretty challenging problem. Uh, that, that Second place where cryptography uh, is commonly used is secure storage, um, which is uh, securing files on a file system. And you can think of it as that. Standard communication is sender and receiver are uh, spatially separated and are changing messages. And here you can say sender and receiver are the same entity and they're just separated in time. Okay, so I encrypt a file today and a year later I want to decrypt and read it, right? So that's like a file system. File system. And modern computers, uh, both Windows, Macs, kind of make it incredibly easy. You can just keep your whole file system encrypted uh, and, and uh, the processors are pretty efficient that you do not really see performance difference. 
these are the common cases, but there are other uses of cryptography too. Uh, one very common one now is that can I do uh, secure computation? I want to get a cloud service provider to do some computing for me, but I want to keep the whole thing secret. So I want to be able to uh, outsource very sensitive, I don't know, it's like my genetic data or whatever, some uh, sensitive sensory data and I want to get it processed and yet I don't trust things out there. Can I do it over, uh, over, over, over uh, cryptographically secure data? Other examples I'd given is a problem called symmetric, uh, sorry, um, uh, secure multi-party computing, which is we all have private data, but we all want to uh, com help compute something for the societal good, let's say. Could we do it in a manner without kind of revealing this thing, other than, of course, the final answer. So secure multi-party computing, uh, databases where we want to make sure that the querier is able to get the answer they want, but not really learn about the other secrets. So there are all, all these kind of problems that uh, have also emerged, but these were at least traditionally kind of the main uh, goals behind cryptography. So step two is the easier one and that refers to, uh, that is done using so-called symmetric cryptograph cryptography. So the basic idea out here is that we assume that the parties already have a shared secret key and how that is done is step one, uh, but for purposes here we assume and then also following that Kirchhoff principle we assume that, we have to assume that encryption algorithm is publicly known, okay, in fact not just I'm using this algorithm precisely. What is your code is known, okay? Like your implementation, all, all those characteristics are known, okay? And then basically what's happening is that uh, I am going to, uh, M is my message, it's called plain text, could be like sensor data and whatnot. For now ignore N, I'm gonna encrypt it <coughs> using my key K. I'm gonna send it over to the other side. I'm gonna decrypt it using the key K and I'm gonna get back my message, okay? Now, of course, the challenge that you immediately face with this with this simplistic thing is the following. Every time I have the same message, like front door open, and it's the same key, and it's a deterministic algorithm, then it's the same ciphertext key in that case, and therefore uh, an adversary by repeated patterns and all would be able to get it. So one thing that you don't want is, uh, uh, you, you, you need to avoid that, uh, if I, um, this kind of a situation where I'm revealing something about the uh, plain text via the ciphertext. So what is done is this, we kind of attach or concatenate with the message, this N, which is called nonce, which basically uh, you can think of it as a publicly known, but never repeating uh, number. So some bit strange bit or never repeating and then repeat over a hugely long time, okay. Uh, this is what we call rolling code in the uh, uh, it's kind of thing. So we append n to the message and then we encrypt on the m and n together in the case and we get the cipher text. But we also send n to the other side. So n is public. Okay. So eavesdropper can eavesdrop on it. Can, can, uh, so it's going to see an n and it's going to be encrypted. And we have to change n every time. Okay, and a very common one is that we're going to start, we'll select some random number n, and then we're going to use increment. Okay, and a properly designed encrypted algorithm, uh, a properly designed uh, algorithm would uh, work fine, and we'll see how we define kind of uh, uh, what, what does it mean for it to be a good uh, algorithm. But so n is referred to as a nonce. So if you see ever what is a nonce, nonce is a Random, num random number with some associated way of changing it from one communication to another, okay? Because otherwise, you are going to be repeating the same key and we'll see why it's a super bad idea to do that. Okay, so uh, then uh, the issue, uh, there are, uh, now not every scheme would have an N, so we'll see when we end it broadly, right? So there's very broadly two ways of thinking about cryptography, uh, about encryption. One, where the key is a single use key, okay? Uh, I have a M, I have a K, I encrypt, send it over, and the next time I need to send a message, I need a different key, okay? In which case, I won't need the nonce because then my property is satisfied. Same message, I'll have a different key, and so I will not need the nonce. So you can say nonce is a zero in that case. Multiple use key, uh, where the same key is being used multiple times, okay? 
and there you have you got to be more careful about it. So, for example, uh, files on the disk, you have no choice but to use multiple uh, keys because otherwise, if I use the same key, then I can detect your file or you can detect my file, right? So, this would be an example where uh, multiple keys you get get to be used. So, that's the very high level general framework. So now to uh, you know, one of one of the most uh, sort of, um, of, of, of cipher that sort of uh, uh, is very commonly kind of studied and described. Uh, it's the so-called one-time pad, and you may have sort of heard about it if you've ever read any popular articles and all. They kind of often make references to it. There was, okay. Uh, it was, I guess, um, sort of proposed by some person uh, in US back in 1970. The basic concept is very simple. This, and this is an example of a one, the name implies one time pad, so one, it's a one time key. The basic idea is that I have my same text, sent in sensor data or whatnot, <coughs> and I'm going to have a key which is going to be exactly the same length. And um, the key is a random number, and I'm going to XOR it. And in this case, I'm going to get this type of text. Okay. So just bit by bit, XOR 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, right? So XOR, if the two numbers are same, I get uh, 0. If two numbers are different, if two bits are different, I get a 1. How will you get this thing? Huh? XOR again, right? So take this thing, okay? And if this key is random, and I XOR it with the plain text, then the output will again be a random number. Okay? So, intuitively, you can kind of reason about it because the nice thing about XORing is, unlike AND and OR, is it's a symmetric in the, in the sense that there's equal probability of you getting 0 and 1, right? Because if you look at the truth table for XOR, half the entries have a 0 output, half the entries have a 1 output. Whereas, on the other hand, AND has one entry with one, three with zero, so it creates a bias, right? And or same way. So XOR and XNOR are the two which sort of have uh, this, uh, this, this, this property. So in this case, it sort of you, you know, if key is random, then you are not going to learn anything about uh, the plain text by looking at the type of key. Okay. Um, so uh, Shannon, yeah, we sort of we study in context of other sort of coding maybe quite a bit, showed that one time pad is secure against and cipher text only attack. What it means is that from the cipher text alone, adversary cannot learn anything about the plain text. Okay. Uh, given that the key is randomly drawn from uh, the set of bits, uh, set of in, 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 in the drawing. So this concept is called as perfect security. Um, so perfect security basically says, and I have this copied from one of the textbooks, but it makes is the following that let's imagine an experiment where uh, given uh, uh, a key which has been drawn uh, in a uniformly distributed random manner from the set of possible keys. And I have two messages, M0 and M1. Again, they're all also something long. Um, and then for any possible cipher in the inner in the string, the probability that M0 encrypted in this game will give us C is the same as the probability that M1 encrypted in this game will give us C. So I cannot distinguish between M0 and M1 given C. That's what it is basically saying. Um, uh, so, uh, if any uh, if any cipher any encryption algorithm satisfies this, we say it's a perfectly secure cipher. Okay, so that's the concept of perfect security. What do we still learn from this? So going back to our definition, if looking at this thing, so it's called perfect security. That's the definition of perfect security that works there. Uh, so that implies a high degree of optimism, right? But uh, let's just talk about this. What if I were to give you ciphertext, is there something about ciphertext you're learning? The length. The length. You are learning the length of the message, right? Uh, so, uh, 
So what that means is that if the length reveals anything about the content, then I'm in trouble, right? So now you can think about how to go around kind of potentially addressing these things. But um, uh, one very sort of uh, one question to ponder about is, and is it better? Uh, is it is it good to compress before encryption? Let's say I give you two choices or, or three choices. Pass a message. You have three choices. You can encrypt the message to send out. I can compress it and then encrypt it and send out. Then I can encrypt it and then compress it and then send out. Think about the trade-off there. I'll sort of uh, running out of time, so I'll, we are out of time actually. So, uh, so but so perfect security is not a panacea, despite the way kind of what perfection seems to apply. Uh, so, uh, do you see any other problem with the scheme? Another practical problem. So the person who has decrypt command has to get a copy of your of your key thing to decrypt it. Yeah, the key. Yeah. So you need to somehow get it to them without a different channel than the one you're using to send it. Yeah. So I guess I guess the thing out here is the following: my key is as long as the message. So I'm trying to send a message, but to do that, I need to get the key across securely. So generally speaking, that doesn't sound like a terribly good idea. Uh, like how, if I can send the key, then why would I bother encrypting, right? Now, of course, it could be that I can send the key beforehand. And in fact, that's how a lot of these systems work. You create, uh, let's say I had sources of randomness, true randomness, that's the truly random number, uh, which are synchronized, as in they will give spit out the same random number and then they are spatially separated. And in fact, quantum cryptography works that way. That's the, um, Google it, you'll see kind of how there are quantum cryptographic systems for communication and kind of the idea is they make use of uh, some entanglement of the distance. So we normally, uh, we know that nothing can travel faster than speed of light, right? That's what, and that is true. But the strict interpretation of it is no information can travel faster than speed of light. But what is possible in quantum uh, thing is that you can have coupled systems and then you take them far away. Okay, and then you call a change of state in one, and there will be an instantaneous change of state of that. Appears to violate uh, speed of light, but it doesn't because there's no information being exchanged. It's just entanglement at least, and something called Bell's effect or something like that. So quantum systems are based around it, but that's outside kind of uh, the purview out here. Um, but the practical problem remains, I mean, if I have to send this key out there. So during World War II, Russians were, for example, like you would use, uh, publish these books of random numbers, and then you will distribute them, okay, and then sort of well, read off those, okay, so one time pass was published. These are like random numbers. Literally, some of these books were constructed by uh, hiring people to toss coins and recording whether you got a ones and zeros, okay. You wanted true source of randomness because any bias in this messes up your system, okay. But so one time pad is quite interesting, um, but uh, has its limitations. Okay, so let's uh, continue uh, this discussion on Tuesday. So we have two presentations on Tuesday, and the rest of the time I'm going to again sort of spend on this cryptography stuff. Oh, and also 